Welcome to the Plastic Surgery Podcast, where we talk about all things relating to plastic surgery. I'm Philip Viennes, that is Dr. Viennes right next to me. This week, we are going to be discussing skin cancer, specifically melanoma. Now, there are two types of skin cancers, correct? What are those two types? So, the can- skin cancer can be categorized into those that are under the melanoma category and those that are non-melanoma. Right. So this week we're just going to be discussing melanoma uh, because we thought that going in depth with both of them would be a lot for just one episode. So Dr. Viennes, what exactly is melanoma? So melanoma is a cancer that arises from those cells that create pigment in our skin called melanocytes. And you said melanocytes? Melanocytes. 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 Those are the little cells that are under your skin that that actually secrete um, melanin. Okay. That gives you pigmentation to your skin. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that, so that if you're right out, like a, if you're in the sun, right, and you get tanned, uh-huh. those are the cells that create the pigment. Oh, in your okay. Skin. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That just went completely over my head. That's, That's why okay. I, I just I had to ask. Um, okay. So, what exactly causes melanoma? Well, the biggest offender is the ultraviolet light that comes from our sun exposure. So you may have heard UVA and UVB, ultraviolet rays. Right, yeah. And UVB is the one that's a little bit more stronger that causes the skin cancers, but also UVA is also a um, offender of uh, developing skin cancer, such as melanoma. Right, right. And just like in very simple terms, describe what happens when UV rays interact with the skin cells. So the skin cells are damaged by the ultraviolet light. Right. So they cause damage to the DNA, which can cause mutations and therefore cause the development of a cancer such as melanoma. Okay, that makes sense. Are certain types of people more susceptible to getting melanoma than other types of people? Yes, those who are fair skin patients, those who So lighter skin? People lighter skin, lighter skin yeah. yes. Patients who or people who have had bad sunburns uh, in the past, typically, yes. Like, so why does getting a sunburn in the past make you more uh, likely to get melanoma? Let me just go back a little bit on Mm. melanoma. So there are different subtypes of melanoma, and the more common ones are those that affect patients that have typically fair skin, light hair, colored blonde, red hair, uh, blue eyes, freckles, mm-hmm. those patients. And, and they do have a history of bad sunburns that have occurred uh, okay. in the past. Um, they may not be those who are out in the sun all day long, but typically these patients who develop melanoma have had sunburns when they were younger uh, okay. in the past intermittently. Um, they typically are indoors, but they know that they right. in the past they, they try avoid, to avoid yeah. the sun. Right. So um, those are the susceptibility factors. Now, there are other subtypes that are less common of those patients who have had chronic sun exposure, who are a little bit older that develop a different type of melanoma that can occur, and that is from chronic sun exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's another subtype, which is those patients that have darker colored skin. That's a little bit different type of melanoma. It may not be related to the sun, but they get it in different parts of their body. They'll get it typically on the palms of their hands or the soles of their feet or under their fingernails. And that's not caused by the sun and darker skin? Well, it's hard to say what it's from, uh, but uh, typically it's probably a more genetic... It's genetic mostly? Probably. Yeah. Okay. And then um, like, just going back to this question... Why are individuals who were burnt in the past more susceptible to getting melanoma? Well, there are different degrees of burning, of course. When I'm talking about a burn, these are bad burns. They they have deeper injury to the tissues. The damaged cell Mm. from the ultraviolet light injures the DNA, and then there's a mutation that occurs. Ah, okay. And from there, it becomes a melanoma. It becomes a cancer, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how common is melanoma in the U.S.? Well, current estimates in the U.S. show that 1 in 37 men and 1 in 56 women Mm. are susceptible to developing melanoma during their lifetime. Really? Wow. And then how does a person or a doctor actually detect the cancer? So there are certain features that are suspicious for melanoma. 
Melanoma is typically a pigmented lesion, skin lesion. Mm -hmm. It looks like a mole. Uh, there are rarely melanomas that have no pigment that we call a melanotic melanomas, but typically the uh, changes that may occur or something that may be uh, suspicious for a uh, melanoma are uh, what we call A, B, C, D, E uh, features. A meaning asymmetrical, meaning instead of being a uh, perfect circle, there may be, it may have like an oblong look to it. Mm -hmm. B is border, if the borders are irregular. Uh, C is color, if there's any variation in the color. D is diameter, anything greater than six millimeters. And E is evolution. So there are things that we look at um, on a clinical examination. Right. And that the patients should be aware of too, the ABCDEs as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if they notice any of changes with a mole or a new mole that might pop up, then it's probably a good idea to have that person, to have their it. doctor look at it oh, okay. to see whether it needs a biopsy or not. So that's a clinical diagnosis. And we do a pathologic diagnosis. So if you think that the patient may have a melanoma, then a biopsy would be indicated okay. where they take a, a portion a of portion, the... Well, they take the whole uh, thing typically, okay. but if it's a very large one, they'll take a portion of it. Mm -hmm. But usually you would like to remove as much of it, if not all of it, just to be able to make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. In order to actually have a certainty of the diagnosis, a biopsy is required Correct. of the cancerous region. Yes. That's what I'm... That's what I, sorry, that's what I meant to say before. Yes. And then does the cancer exist in that mole or can it exist other places like around the mole or, or even other places no, that's in a the very body. good question because melanomas usually travel through the what we call the lymphatic system which mm -hmm. are these vessels that are within your tissues that take uh, the fluid that is released outside of your blood vessels back to your heart and they follow a certain pattern into these draining lymph nodes which are like filters right and so there's a pattern of of spread Mm -hmm. So when the melanoma travels, it could travel outside of the area of the lesion mm -hmm. and they could develop a term that we call satellite ptosis or a melanoma in transit. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's actually leaving the area of the skin and you may notice a little deposit of the melanoma along the path of the lymphatic drainage. And then it can also reach the um, lymph nodes, but it can also spread into your bloodstream as well. Really? Yeah. So even it can be present even if you don't have a mole? or is Well, it usually there is a mole that's cancerous or a melanoma. Right. And then with the uh, further diagnostic workup that can be done, uh, you can determine whether it has it's spread, spread or not. Right. Right. It basically originates from the mole? Melanoma's usually do not arise from an existing mole. They typically arise from just an area that did not have a mole, oh, okay. what we call de novo. It starts from an area where there may not have been a mole. But it, it comes from, like, it's. There, is there a mole in almost every case of well, melanoma? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, these tumors arise from melanocytes, which are right. cells in our skin. Uh, so if a skin starts acting or changing and right. becoming malignant, uh, then it develops into a mole that makes in that sense. localized okay. area. Okay, that makes sense. That, so that's a, it's a cell that's transformed into a malignancy. How is melanoma treated? And then how likely is it that someone will survive from the disease? First of all, um, going back again to the initial diagnosis, mm -hmm. determining whether a patient has a melanoma. Right. Or not. But uh, if, they, if it's determined done. after mm -hmm. the biopsy that they right. have melanoma, how right. is it treated? So... So it all depends on the depth of invasion of the biopsy. So what happens is that piece of tissue is sent to the pathology lab. The pathologist looks at it under microscope. And probably the most important part of that evaluation, not only making the diagnosis of melanoma, but as far as staging or determining the severity of the melanoma right. is the actual depth of invasion. So they actually measure how deep it has gone oh, into gone the, in the skin. skin. Right. Right. So that's why it's important to do the proper type of biopsy mm -hmm. in that you would like to have the whole layer of skin, the whole thickness of the skin all the way down to the fat layer oh. when they do the biopsy. So they want to measure the depth of invasion. That's mm -hmm. why it's important when they do the biopsy, they want to get Everything. the whole thing right, if they right, can, right. yes. But if the melanoma is large, sometimes we'll just take a sample of it. Right. So after they determine the depth of invasion, from that information, they can decide how they're going to manage the melanoma. That's why it's very, very important to detect these early on. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you catch them early, you have a much better prognosis of survival. Right. 
So the just like with any disease, I mean, with right, any but, but especially mel- with cancer, yeah, melanoma has a higher risk of causing problems as far as metastasis and and a, and a poor prognosis if it invades deeply into the uh. tissues compared to some other skin cancers that are there. Right. So so again making the diagnosis early is very, very important. So if you catch it early and it's thin, then the treatment would be removal Mm -hmm. of that surrounding skin. And usually if it's like less than a millimeter, typically, which is very superficial, um, then they usually remove about a centimeter all the way around. So it's still a reasonable size open area that has to be treated and closed. And that's what I usually do. And then patient would have to follow up with a dermatologist and have surveillance of that area to make sure that they don't develop another skin cancer or they have a higher possibility of developing another skin cancer. Right. They're more susceptible. Right. Exactly. So you want to be able to have some type of surveillance program for those patients. So then like if it's deep, if it's deep. So then there's the other range. You have those that are intermediate Mm. um, that are between one and four millimeters. Their prognosis is lower. If you, if you catch these early on, um, the ones that are more superficial, there's about an 80 to 90% survival rate in 10 years. Oh, okay. Whereas if you go deeper, like if it's four millimeters or more, right. the, the prognosis is much lower. It's between 40 and 50% survival really? rate in 10 years. Wow. So, so those patients that are greater than one millimeter, you have to see whether or not, or one millimeter or greater, they have to evaluate whether the cancer has spread or the melanoma has spread to the lymph nodes. Mm-hmm. So if a patient has one millimeter or greater, they generally remove at about two centimeters all the way around. So that's double the amount of tissue that's removed usually mm-hmm. on those that are between one and two millimeters. Sometimes they get a little bit, a little less tissue that they remove, but anything two millimeters or greater, definitely two centimeters all the way around. Oh, okay. And they do a sentinel lymph node biopsy on those patients because they want to determine whether or not the melanoma has spread to the lymph nodes right and if it has spread to the lymph nodes do they go through like the normal cancer treatment procedures like chemo or well, radiation yes. so if so then they have to go through a further staging process of diagnostic imaging that they do like they'll have cat scans and right. blood tests and so forth to see whether or not the cancer has spread beyond the lymph nodes the lymph nodes right, right. And then from there, they determine whether or not the patient would be getting chemotherapy, interferon. If it has gone to the lymph nodes, they usually remove those lymph nodes in that, that, in that entire, what they call the draining basin. So if it's, oh, okay. so you have lymph nodes in different areas of your body. So mm-hmm. if they identify a location where it's drained into one of the lymph nodes, and they'll go back again and remove those lymph nodes those in that, lymph that nodes. general area, right? So not really to like eliminate the cancer, but to to isolate it. Well, to isolate it, right? I mean, the idea would be to get rid of to it. To eliminate well, right, it, right. right? Exactly, but because you know that it's it's going to follow those lymph nodes, right? And, and and maybe it's gone to some more of the other ones that you haven't tested yet, right? So they want to make sure they get all that, right? And then removed. for for people who don't know, what are lymph nodes, real fast? Okay, so they're, they're like the filters. They're they're the immune. Um, portion of the filters of our body uh so and do they do they move around do they move around the body no they're in different locations they're in the face for example they're around in front of the cheek area they could be under your neck here down along the outer part of your neck down to the base of your neck Mm. under your arms in your groin area so they're they're around your your organs inside your body as well right they, they basically filter your your, the fluid that runs through your body. So if you, let's say, for example, if you have an infection, they basically could swell up and they become painful and right. you have some type of, they, they trigger the immune response mm. you know, to help trigger that. But also they wind up trapping also the cancer cells there right. as well as they go through there. So right. they do some, they're, they're involved with the immune system. So why would removing them isolate the cancer cells? So, so let's say, for example, they find tumor cells in the lymph node, then there's a possibility that it may have gone to some of the other lymph nodes in that, that local area. So they want to make sure that they remove surgically those lymph nodes. Right. Is it easier for the cancer to tra- to transfer between lymph nodes? Yeah. Well, as it passes through there, through, they, yeah. as, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the lymphatic system is constantly working. Right. So exactly. The, so the fluid is constantly moving from one part of the body right. into the lymph nodes, and then it gets through these other little vascular uh, mm. types of 
uh, lymphatic channels, and they, it ultimately goes back into your heart. So there's right. like a circulation uh, in that right. lymph fluid. That so when those that fluid comes through, through it's it. honestly like, like, yeah, it's like a, it's like a stream, the, right. you know? And so uh, you want to, if it gets trapped here, you want to make sure that the cancer you clean it up. Yeah, right. it doesn't, exactly. doesn't get right. through. Right. Um, I mean, it, once you That's remove the... theory. The, so when, That's the theory. Oh, uh, okay. So That's like, the theory. So just walk me through it. You remove the lymph nodes, and then fluid doesn't run through that part, or... That's a good question. Um, they probably would remove as many as they can. Right. And there are lymphatic channels that are still present mm -hmm. that are there. And there are other pathways that the lymphatic fluid winds up going back to your heart again. Right. You know? But they may not go through those lymph nodes that were right. removed at that point. It gets directed to right. another, another one. Ah, uh, right. exactly. I understand. But, it, but, but the problem is, is that if, um, let's say, if it's under the arm or in the groin area, um, and you remove lymph nodes, um, you're not going to remove every single one of right, them. Right, you can't, but, right? I mean, you could, but do you increase your risk of developing like fluid buildup, right. you know, in your arm or your leg right. and so forth? So Because there's nothing to filter it. Exactly, right, right. right. So it gets blocked and right. it gets stays in it's one the, location, yeah. you get swelling. Wow, yeah. But, you know, there are some other pathologic features too that they look at, not only the depth, they also look for whether there's like an ulceration and they look at some other features that may be going on in the cells uh, um, okay. that could upgrade the or upstage the melanoma from something that might be superficial to something that's a little bit deeper. Right. Uh, so, okay. so there are so a lot of different things that they look at uh, okay. with those patients. And right? you, you said ulcers and what, what else? Well, if there's ulceration, ulceration. Yeah, what that, is that ul mean? ulceration? Ulceration means that um, the the tissue has died ah, in that area, gotcha. and it's so it's a more aggressive, right, sort right, of thing, right. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but, I mean, like basically, the more damage they find under this under the skin, the more likely that the disease has spread. The depth of the, invasion, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's like more, li and then that's that increases the probability that the disease has spread. Has spread, right? Exactly. Okay. How can someone protect against? Getting melanoma? Some of the things that we um, recommend are avoiding the midday sun, um, right. the ultraviolet light that enters our atmosphere. And of course, like sunscreen too? Yeah, sunscreen, yeah. But the but the timing really, if you stay out of the sun between 10 and 4, for example, 10 in the morning till 4 p.m. is a good idea. Uh, if you want to go out right. before 10 a.m. Be or after 4 p.m. And that's because the sun rays are most aggressive during that time period? Well, they, so, so the sun, when it's, like coming perpendicular to the atmosphere, right. the ozone layer is a certain yeah, thickness, thickness right? right? But as yeah. it goes down to the horizon, it has to go through a larger, uh, so you have more protection of the ultraviolet right. light. Okay, So that's one, and you as you mentioned, sunscreen, sunscreen is important, yeah. anything greater than SPF of 15, I usually say 30. Right. Uh, wearing a hat, wearing mm. clothing, protective clothing. So anything to protect the skin, right, basically. Right, exactly, and also checking your skin, you know, Regularly. for any kind of unusual, you know, pigmented lesions that you may be worried about. Right. So, so sort of doing, doing the surveillance for that is mm -hmm. very important. And then um, if someone gets burned, is there anything that they should do to treat the burn? I mean, I know aloe is like really popular. That's more, yeah. So, But that's just for like cooling right, effect. Right, exactly. It's more palliative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like once you get burned, there's nothing really you can do to... You just have to wait for it to heal. To heal, right. right. And then, but uh, like most importantly, probably not go back out in the sun while you have burned skin. Exactly. Because your skin's like it'll, get, it'll make it a lot worse. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Okay. And then last thing, you don't recommend tan beds, do you? No, absolutely not. Um, Why? What, like, well, because they still have a, the UVA. Right. Um, exactly. And it's still damaging to the tissues and it increases your risk for even even if you don't get burned skin cancer even if yes, you don't get burned right, in the tan exactly. bed it, yeah. it still Any, increases your risk it's ultraviolet radiation right you know so no it's going to cause damage no tan beds no tan beds. okay <laughs> okay guys thank you for watching the plastic surgery podcast next week we are not going to be here actually so in two weeks we will go over the other type of skin cancers the non-melanoma skin cancers correct right awesome okay Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Have a wonderful week.